when in the Columbia and northwards on the Pacific coast, Japan was our next neighbour across the way. Only the placid sea, the Pacific, between us. Then, as it had been for 200 years or more, it was, by its own laws, barred to the world. Except, and that with very close restrictions, to the Chinese and the Dutch. It was death to any other foreigner, or even to any Japanese who had been, from any cause, absent in any foreign land. Even shipwrecked mariners, unless fortuitously speedily relieved by some foreign warship of sufficient force, had to pay the penalty of death sooner or later. A utopia of the East, an Easter Island empire laved and sustained by lone teeming seas. To us, on its opposite shore, gazing searchingly into the far, far offing, it was ever an object of intense curiosity. What of such people? What of their manner of life? What of their unrivaled wealth with its gleam of gold and things most precious? I resolved within myself to personally solve the mystery, if possible, at any cost of effort. Yea, life itself. My plan was to present myself as a castaway, and with all seeming confidence, without seeming to court it, to rely on their humanity. The present is the story of it. Whaling was easy in the Japan Sea. The fish were so numerous that we had no occasion to chase them with our ship. We had nothing to do but to lower our boats, harpoon them, and bring them alongside for stripping. The ship being now nearly full, I asked the captain to go back towards Japan, where, on the island of Timoshi, off its northern coast, I intended to land. With much reluctance, he consented according to our bargain. And so, against the strong and earnest remonstrations of the captain and crew, I stepped into my boat, taking with me my box of books and stationery, a few clothes, but I had no chart. My comrades refused to unloose the knot which bound me to them. One of them offered to accompany me. I refused him. A sailor's feelings are ever warm and true. Myself, with averted face, had to cut the rope by which I hung to all of them. With a quivering, God bless you, Mac, they bade me along, and as they thought, a last adieu. Thus, to my family and friends, I was, for a while, as one dead. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. There are lots of very old things in Japan. The people, the hotels, and most of all, the royal family. The Koshitsu is the oldest continuous monarchy in the world, and so, a great recommendation from Magellan's collection this week is Banzai Tenno, Long Live the Emperor, from the series Asia's Monarchies, which tries to unravel this ancient institution and how it survived World War II into the modern day. Magellan TV have supported this channel for more than a year, and they are a great choice if you like documentaries. They have more than 3,000 works to choose from. And now, you can take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month, even if you've joined Magellan before and lapsed. You can simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted membership today. Thanks. At dawn the next morning, I saw smoke on the island, and men launched a boat, like a rather large skiff, and rowed it towards me. When about a hundred yards from me, they hove up and began to salam me, throwing out their arms, palms up, bowing, stroking their great beards, and uttering a guttural sound in respectful salutation, as indicated by their look and manner. When near enough, I accosted them with a, how do you do? with a salute with the right arm. They seemed to take it in compliment in response. On landing, I was greeted by about a hundred men, women and children. On approaching the large house, we were met by a Japanese whose exterior denoted consequence. The front part of his head was shaved, and the hair was gathered into a top, or queue, which projected slightly over the forehead. His dress consisted of a long, cotton, clerical-looking gown. 
In entering the house, which was of one story with paper windows, we had to walk about twenty feet on bare ground. The priest then busied himself in spreading out mats, stirring the fire, and giving orders. He, by signs, requested me to put off my sandals. I, for the first time, then perceived that he had none on. Placing mine in a particular spot, he gave me to understand that I would always find them there. After a short interval, my host invited me to partake of a repast which he kindly provided. It consisted of boiled rice, some good fish, ginger, preserved shellfish, and a variety of pickles. Before and during the meal, my host several times offered me a bottle of something which he called Grog Yes. On smelling it, for being then a temperance man, I did not taste it, I found it very like whiskey. The liquor is a distillation from rice, called by the Japanese sake. The name Grog Yes puzzled me, but on inquiry afterwards, I learned that it arose from the fact of the crew of the Lawrence, who had been in that quarter, answering, Grog? Yes, fetch it on, when it was offered to them. I may here mention that when in China, on my way to Japan, I was told that one of the men of this same Lawrence was killed by the Japanese for attempting to escape while a captive with them. I never knew the particulars of the case. It did not frighten me. After breakfast, I took a short walk out of doors, the only freedom I had in Japan, and that under close watch. On my return, I found that my kind host had provided me with a bed and a good mosquito bar. Not having slept the night before, I turned in, and now did so most comfortably. On the following day, two Oyakata, chiefs or overseers of the island, visited me. They took a minute inventory of everything brought ashore. Everything seemed to excite their curiosity, especially my books and letters. They looked intensely at every article, first one way, then another, and then would talk about it. Last of all, they opened my keg of provisions. Being religiously abstainers from meat, they were horror-struck in finding the beef and pork. After a long consultation, they examined the pieces with a long fork. The people I was now among were not Japanese proper, but Ainos, who are a tributary to the former. The Ainos, so far as I saw and could learn, have no government of their own, but seem to be simply scattered individualities in families without any ostensible communal organization. Though there seems to have been such from the uniformity of their manner of life and subordination to their distinctive customs and religion and to their chief, so called, but how so constituted or being, I cannot say. I've been asked as to my idea of the origin and racial features of these Ainos. I have never read up, especially on the subject of human races, though I am especially familiar with the inhabitants, natives, and other of the west and northwest coasts of North America, from San Francisco to Sitka. Amongst these, especially the Hydras and Bella Coola Coast Indians of British Columbia, I remark a striking similarity of physical type with my sturdy friends of Yeso, but in disposition they differ much. At length we anchored in the outer harbour of Nagasaki. A great number of the inhabitants, officials, I presume, came on board. Among them, Shere Takachian Sama, one of the five men who assisted the governor in the government of the district of Nagasaki. He and another of note sat, in Japanese fashion, in the middle of the cabin, with two pale-faced secretaries by them, with writing materials books of apparently English or European binding, and a large book like an atlas. Sat also was an interpreter, a very old gentleman with a benign expression of countenance, rising a little, asked me in a very kind tone what my name was. I told him, and he repeated it to Sherai. The latter then asked me through Moriyama, another interpreter, where I was born. Of this young man, a few special words are called for. He was by far the most intelligent person I met in Japan. He had a pale cast of thought, piercing black eyes which seemed to search into the very soul and read its every emotion. He spoke English pretty fluently and even grammatically. He was my daily companion, a lovable one ever afterwards during my sojourn in Japan. I asked him whether he, Moriyama, had ever been out of the country, 
to which he replied in the negative. He told me that he had a large library and also that he was studying Latin and French. Nagasaki is a town, or city rather, of I should say about 10,000 houses. The houses, though small compared to ours of our city, seemed on the whole to be of a better class than any I had seen elsewhere in the country. Murayama came in and told me that in half an hour I would appear before the governor to answer questions that would be put to me. He told me not to be afraid, to take courage, that he would interpret for me and that he would be sworn. He instructed me also that before seeing the governor I should see an image on a metal plate at the four-door, these were his words, and further that this image was the devil of Japan and that I must put my foot on it. I told him I would do so because I did not believe in images. Very good, very good, said he, and then retired. In entering, I looked for the plate with image in the four-door of Murayama, and there, I, in plan, saw it. It appeared to me to be a bronze plate, round, about six inches in diameter, flat on the ground, with something delineated on it which, stooping to examine, I took to be the virgin and child. Told to put my foot on it, being a Protestant, I unhesitatingly did so. Pointing to the door, he said, You will see the governor enter by that door, but you must not look at him, but bow low. I then heard a low rustling sound approaching towards us, and as if by a given signal, everyone fell flat on their face. Behind me, close and all about, were soldiers at arms. The governor entered. Moriyama repeated his injunction to bow low. Still angry, I didn't. I co tow to no man. It required no effort to refrain, I just would not do it. Curious to read my fate at the hands of His Excellency, I looked at him fearlessly, but respectfully, full in the face. So did he me. I had just quickly before that looked around and saw everyone, even the soldiers, flat on their faces, the hands being placed on the ground and the forehead resting on them. They all remained in this position for quite a time, say 10 or 15 seconds, which, in dead silence, the governor and I stared at each other. At length, rising from his sitting position, slowly, on his knees and stretching forth his arms, the governor addressed me a few words, deep-toned and low, which though I did not understand them, I took from his manner and look, not to be unfriendly. Afterwards, for I could not at the time, I asked Moriyama what he said. He answered, He said you must have a big heart. During nearly all my confinement and nearly daily, Moriyama and others were my pupils. There was fourteen of them. Their habit was to read English to me, one at a time. My duty was to correct their pronunciation and, as best as I could in Japanese, explain meaning, construction, etc. It was difficult to make them catch some of our sounds, especially the consonants, and some of the combinations, particularly, were impracticable to them. For instance, they cannot pronounce, except very imperfectly, the letter L. They pronounce it R, so that they rendered my name Renardo Macdonardo, with a strong burr of the R. They also had a habit of adding an I or O at the end after a consonant. My place of residence, though really a prison, for I had no liberty beyond the bars of my cage, was the resort of quite a variety of people. Men of all sorts, students, officers, priests, and people in general of the respectable classes, except women, came to stare at me as a natural curiosity. The only exception as to women was in the case of one of my guards, the captain of them. He asked me for my consent to bring his wife and daughter and three of their females to see me. Of course I gave it, for I was anxious also to see how their women looked. They came, entering the guard room and squatting there like men. I invited them, if they wished to see me, to enter my apartment, the Lion's Den. They all did so, giggling. I cannot say that they were beautiful, nor, on the other hand, that they were ugly. Their general expression of countenance was that of smiling, good-natured and artlessness, calculated to make a favourable impression. Being nothing of a ladies man, poor at small talk, I had no conversation with them, merely in lion roar addressing them on their entry and departure with a few words Japanese in compliment.
Missing the captain shortly afterwards, for we were close friends, I inquired about him and was informed that his head had been chopped off. That was how they expressed it, for breaking the law, forbidding what he had done in bringing women to my prison. If so, which I could scarcely believe, the law seemed to me to be a very harsh one. In course of conversation with my guards and visitors, I caught at certain sailor terms used by them which I suspected they must have picked up from British or American sailors about the place. They used, without telling me where they got them, to ask the meaning of these terms, for by this time I could speak a sort of pidgin Japanese, or at least had the reputation for it. Many of these terms I could not literally translate, as they were simply sailor objurgations, meaningless and innocent generally, such as shiver me timbers, etc. My imprisonment, though close, allowed me daily communication with people, many sorts, who, from curiosity, came to see me. The Japanese, I would observe, are naturally chatty, always in a vein of good humour. In this respect, I was in rapport with them. In look, facial features, etc., I was not unlike them, my sea life and rather dark complexion, moreover, giving me their general colour, a healthy bronze. I never had a cross word with any of them, and I think I passed rather as a favourite amongst them, eliciting, ever and anon, the compliment of the governor, as to my heart. Naturally, they are brave, I should say utterly fearless of death, their instincts markedly military. I believe they would suffer annihilation rather than surrender in defence of their country. Unconquered, unconquerable, that is their proud position. Enjoying a well-guarded liberty in their social life and a perfect toleration of creed, except as to that form of Christian faith known as Roman Catholic, banned for reasons of state over 200 years ago, they had nothing to complain of. Under that mask of placidity which they presented, I could see the inner working of aspirations for a higher life among the nations of the earth. I perceived this more particularly in Murayama and some of the younger of my pupils, all grown men, with minds of keenest search, acute enough to pierce the veil of their old, traditional life, which, to them, was as the rotting shroud of a dead past. They, I would say, are naturally the cleverest people I know of. I say cleverest not in the sense of deceit, but in its highest and purest meaning. All they require is light from without. On this head, I could say much as the result of my experience and reflections, but refrain and confine myself to my narrative. At last, about the end of April, I heard for the first time in the country cannon shots. I asked whether the new governor had arrived. With a leer, they said yes, at the same time looking at each other. At this time I had several or all of the interpreters with me. I did not know, at the time, what made them crowd in them. This one, when they had all gone, came up to the bars of my cage and told me that a foreign ship had arrived and that the guns were fired as a signal for troops from the interior. The foreign ship which had just arrived was the American Corvette, the Preble, of 18 guns, in command of Captain Glynn. While I was in the shed, 13 American seamen were brought in. They had on their ordinary sailor dress. I had on my best Japanese dress, very plain and respectable. They appeared very pale and thin. We all appeared at the same time before the governors. The governor, through interpreter, then told us of the arrival of the ship and that they had, after consultation, decided on allowing us to depart by her. So, on April 26th, 1849, after ten months of sojourn in Japan, including about seven months of teaching English to a class of 14 government interpreters, I was, as stated, delivered over to the American authorities. On March 31st, 1854, the first convention, first in all history, I believe, was made by Japan with a foreign power. That was with the United States of America. It was soon followed by others in like tenor with other foreign powers. Now, not only in commerce, but in general international comity, Japan is open to the world. It now stands practically abreast of the most advanced nationalities of Europe in political status. <laughs>